So our second panel of the morning um, is focused on a little something called NIL, name, image, likeness. As I pointed out a few minutes ago when we closed the first panel, much of that conversation got dominated by NIL, which should tell you the frustrations that coaches have, perhaps collectives, student athletes, et cetera. Today, we are honored to have not only a great moderator for this panel, but great guests and Andy Schwartz, Desiree Reed Francois, Maya Nanji, and Walker Jones. Ross Dellinger is a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. He's the son of a high school football coach. He's covered college sports for nearly two decades, starting as a sports writer for his college paper before moving on to cover Auburn, Missouri, and LSU, among others. He joined SI in 2018. He's got great relationships with some of the leading athletic directors, commissioners, student athletes, and coaches around the country, not just in the SEC. And he knows the NIL, NIL landscape better than almost anybody. So let's give a round of applause for Ross Dellinger, Andy Schwartz, Desiree Reed Francois, Maya Naji, and Walker Jones. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to follow the last panel. I don't have an Amy Perko on my panel, and I don't have a Charlie Baker. But we're going to do the best that we, that we can. Uh, I'm Ross Dellinger, like he said. Uh, I um, I live here in D.C., just a few blocks away. My my wife is a political reporter. We moved up here about four years ago from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A little bit of a culture shock, as you uh, as you might think, and never thought that Washington D.C. would become the uh, epicenter of uh, college football. But uh, here we all are. Uh, we're going to talk about NIL, which uh, it stands for Now It's Legal. Uh, right, Walker? Now It's Legal. Um, and my relationship with NIL goes goes back uh, about four years when I moved up here, started meeting with Congress uh, men and women and, and senators. And, and I tell this story a lot. I I, uh, I, I walked into a, a senator's office for a meeting for a, a, an interview. And uh, the senator and the chief of staff were, were there in front of me. And um, I started my first question. And the chief of staff said, no, no, no. In this office, we ask the questions. And the senator asked me a question that, uh, you know, pretty quickly I realized we were going we to have a problem getting a bill passed in Congress when the senator asked, so what is the NCAA? So. Four years later, here we are. Big surprise that we don't we don't have a bill. There is more knowledge from from lawmakers right now, and in, because of things like this, probably that we we have uh, more knowledge. So, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off here, and and I'm gonna start with my left here with Maya. Um, as, as a student athlete yourself, first of all, do you like to be called a student athlete? And second of all, tell us about the impacts of NIL that you have seen, the bad and and the good. I for sure do like being called a student athlete because I am actually studying medicine after I play professionally um, in basketball. I do want to become a doctor. So I'm very big on having the best of both worlds academically and athletically. And then I would say NIL has been huge for student athletes like myself. I think, especially as I look around the room here, I do not see myself re represented in any of these high positions that you all hold. And so Having NIL and the opportunity to brand myself as a Black female athlete and be a role model to younger Black female athletes is huge. I think growing up, representation has always been important to me and is part of the reasons why I came to Arizona to play for a Black female head coach. And I think NIL just allows me to use my platform as a student athlete who wants to become a doctor and play professionally for basketball. I think that's huge. I'm able to... Um, use my commitment to community service and tie that to my brand. I've done food drives before our games and called the fans to donate food to the food bank in Tucson. And I think that's just one of the smallest, small things I can do in terms of like using my brand for nonprofit activities to help people, which is what I'm super big on doing. I think also I'm able to curate my brand to things that I like, like curly hair products and natural hair care and stuff like that, that doesn't have a, a big audience or maybe people don't think about it as much. And I think NIL is just huge because I can grow my platform. I can earn money in college, help pay for medical school after I graduate. And then I can use that and I'll have a bigger network because I'm interacting with all of you and people in higher positions. And it can just help me when I want to start clinics and I want to start 
doing real work in when I get older as a doctor. So I think it's huge. The bad, the negatives, do you see any? Mm, I do. I think it's very unregulated. Um, <laughs> I think it's also hard to manage as student athletes, especially myself. I have a very busy schedule. And I think the way that some companies just have unrestricted act access to some of these athletes is a little bit unfair. I think if there was a little more regulation, um, I think it'd be more manageable, especially as a student athlete. Like I wake up early in the morning, I have class, I have to go to practice. Practice can end anywhere from like four to five hours at, at the gym. We have uh, rehab and stuff we have to do after that. I have homework and I have to eat, like hang out. Like there's a lot of stuff I have to do in a day and I only have a limited amount of time. And so I think the, the one of the drawbacks I would say is the time management aspect of it because these companies just feel like they can contact us whenever, however, and it's a little bit invasive. I'd also say the inequity between um, male and female uh, sports. I would say some of the players on our basketball, men's basketball team, they have earned it 100%, but they just get more NIL opportunities than the women's basketball team, even though we also have earned it. So that's the only thing that I don't understand. Like we were just in the final four a couple years ago and they made some good runs too. But the, the rewards that we got from that were very inequitable. And I think, especially with Title IX, that was such a huge step for female athletes. I think that can't fade into the background when NIL starts to like make more of a come up, you know? Desiree, Missouri Athletic Director, you, you're hanging on every word there, right? Tell us what, what give us your and administrator's assessment of the NIL situation and, and kind of what you heard from Maya there. Well, I think that's a mic drop. After, after listening to Maya, you articulated it so well. Um, from my perspective, you know, it, we're having some growing pains, but anytime you have a massive change, growing pains should be anticipated. And that's where we are. But the benefits that I see from name, image, and likeness, first of all, it's right. Second of all, we should have been doing this 20 years ago, I re but we didn't. Um, I remember the Jeremy Bloom case. And Jeremy Bloom was this, uh, he played football at the University of Colorado. I think my colleague, Rick George, uh, he probably had found someone better to talk to. But um, Rick George was here earlier. And Jeremy Bloom played football there. And then he was an Olympic skier. And he had an opportunity, I think it was with Nickelodeon and maybe Ralph Lauren, if memory serves. He had an opportunity to go do a commercial. But the NCAA came back and said, no, he couldn't. If he wanted to still... Uh, uh, be a kicker on the Colorado football team, he couldn't do it. And I remember thinking, and I was relatively, I was only about five years in um, after I graduated from law school at the University of Arizona. And thank you. Uh, and, and Dr. Robbins was very good on the panel earlier. You forgot to mention that he was very good. That's right. So very good. Yeah. Now. Sorry about that. Host and fellow uh, Mississippian, the SIP. Um, but I remember seeing that and, and thinking, why, why can't they? That just doesn't seem right. But I was still relatively new. So I'm so glad that we are finally here. And, you know, we talk so much about the negatives and the, and I think someone called it terrible today um, about NIL, but you know what? There's so much great about this. There's so much good that is being done, not just on monetization, but I also look at, I have 550 student athletes at the University of Missouri. And we now have 550 entrepreneurs if our student athletes want to take advantage of that. And you know what? Things that the conversations that we're having, because this is an evolution, are so much different than where we were not only um, three years ago, but even six months ago. I remember I saw one student athlete at the start of um, the start of uh, when they came back. Uh, I guess it was about this time last year. And he said, Miss Francois, I got I learned how to fish. And I said, well, how did you do that? And he said, and this young man is from inner city Dallas. And he's like, well, I did um, a post on social media saying that I would sign autographs at birthday parties. And so I went to a nine-year-old's birthday party and, you know, part of it is they had me fish. And so I got $600 for this birthday, actually it was $200 for this birthday party. And I signed a bunch of autographs and the benefit was I learned how to fish. And I was like, well, that is wonderful. And I said, what are you going to do with that money? And he said, well, Ms. Francois, my mom is having some trouble right now and she needs to pay her electric bill. So I'm going to send that one home for her so she can pay her electric bill. And at and that moment, I thought, you know what? This is so incredibly important. 
we have a responsibility. Yes, there are challenges and we all have huge to-do lists and this is nuanced, but we have a responsibility to figure this out, recognizing that growth, there's going to be challenges, but let's put our heads together. We have heard those four points today and I think those four points are lovely. Um, I think we could probably do a little bit more, but that's an aside. Uh, and, and let's figure this out because you know what? It's good for Maya. It's good for my student athletes. And uh, it's just the right thing. So that's where I think it, we are. Desiree, a lot of things you, you said are, are, are good things about NIL and this, this market. So why? Why a, federal, why a federal bill? Why do we need something? Well, let's look around the room. We're all competitors, right? We're all looking for advantages. And so name, image, and likeness can be one of those advantages. So um, I think as we're looking at the regulatory space, we have, I think, President, uh, we talked about kind of the different laws and there's 30 different laws and, and heck, Missouri has a different law than probably what's going on in Arizona. That's probably what's Arkansas and some of my other colleagues. And so because we have different laws and a different regulatory scheme, one of the best ways to ensure the uniformity, and I think that's what we're all looking for, we're looking for a uniform playing field. Let's have, um, let's look at and see if federal action is what's is what's best. And and I think it is um, because otherwise, if we're left to our own devices right now, then we're all going to be looking for that competitive edge. I remember a long time ago when I was at the University of Tennessee, we had a legendary foot, um, athletic director named Doug Dickey. Doug Dickey walked in one day. And he pointed at the NCA rule book, which I don't even know if we print them anymore. I, thought, I think they're all online. But anyway, I'm, I'm aging myself. But he had, it was like a two inch um, thick rule book. Uh, you guys remember those? Remember those, Dave, how thick it was? And he's like, well, young lady, that rule book over there, there is a thousand minds looking for ways around those rules. And I just thought, oh boy, welcome to the Southeastern Conference. Okay, um, but he was right. And so we need some uniform guidelines to make sure that we, and we think about kind of the student and we hear the student athlete voice. I don't know if I thought about how our student athletes are being contacted as much as what you articulated. And we need to think about those things, but if we're going to create meaningful change, we need to listen um, and listen to, the, listen to our end users, listen to our constituents and come up with those guidelines. And we had a really good starting point today. Uh you need you need rules to, in a way, protect your yourself from this this race that we're seeing, right? And we we've seen it in the SEC footprint, and we'll get to this later. But how how these laws are changing, right? And prohibiting enforcement. You you saw Charlie Baker talk about some of these things. Andy, uh, economist from California, it, you are uh, you're very opinionated, and uh, you have you had some thoughts on some of the things said earlier in the in the earlier panel. Um, so give us. Your your assessment of what's going on certainly right now in the NIL space, but please feel free to address anything that uh, you thought maybe you you disagreed with in our in the last the group that was up here. I don't want to take that much time of our shared time, uh, but uh, um, first of all, I want to say that what Desiree just said is really refreshing because it's the first time I've heard an athletic director not just jump to this is chaotic and so therefore it's bad. It's exactly what you said. It's chaotic because it's undoing something like 70 years of, of what I would call cartel enforcement of a price fix. Oh, you and, are going to be spicy. <laughs> and, and, and let me be clear. When I say the word cartel, I'm speaking as an economist. It has nothing to do with drugs. <laughs> drug cartels are called drug cartels because they also fix prices, not because they sell drugs. Okay, so the, the cartel part is different from the drug. Um, Didn't think we'd be talking about I'm drug lost. cartels, I'm but lost. hey, here we are. I'm lost. Okay. I'm not um, uh, but it, that's exactly right, is that it can be painful to unwind anti-competitive conduct and the move to a competitive market can sometimes be messy. A lot of the people in this room, I think, feel very good about free enterprise in the rest of their lives. And it's strange that when we get into a college sports situation, everyone becomes a socialist and is very concerned that somebody might get a penny more than somebody else, even if they earn it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the market now, to the extent to which they're problems, are self-inflicted even in the last few years. So, for example, the NCAA didn't do a lot in uh, June of 2019 in terms of giving guidance to schools. But one thing they said was, whatever you do, do not run the money through your school or else you'll have to comply with Title IX. And 
Schools went, yes, of course. We don't want to have to comply with Title IX on this stuff. Let's get collectives to do it so we can evade Title IX. Well, now everyone's saying, oh my gosh, 95% of the money is going to men and 5% of the money is going to women. Well, what did you think was going to happen when you set up a system to evade Title IX? If you had run it through the schools, the schools would have said, oh gosh, we got to make sure we don't hit 50-50. We hit 55-45, something like that. We better make sure that if somebody wants to set up a football collective, that they have a matching fund for the women's lacrosse team. But, but it was intentional to evade the law. And you created a great growth in Jason's making money. People are making money outside the school. But you did that on purpose. And, um, and that sh this should have been a very foreseeable context, uh, uh, um, consequence if you take something out of the space in which gender equity is relatively, and I know there are problems with how Title IX is enforced with the university, but it's way better than, than the way the market is, especially given what I would call sort of the sexism of fandom. Um, and so, yeah, it's obvious that that, that, that could happen. I, I could say a lot more, but maybe that gets us started. It, it does, and then to your left, uh, you, you go, we got a collective representative here, and there's several collectives, I think, um, represented in the room today. Um, Walker, tell us about what you do. <laughs> I don't know. That was a great segue. Thank you, Andy, uh, for that. Uh, geez, where do I begin? Yes, uh, cartels and money. Anyway, uh, no, look, it's, uh, it's great to be here in this room with a lot of thought leaders and stakeholders in college athletics. I was a former student athlete. Um, college athletics gave me so much of my life. Uh, my professional career, my personal career. So it's very personal to be in the sense of what college athletics can do in the life of our young men and women. Uh, and that's really why I got involved on that is how do we preserve, protect, and enhance the experience for our student athletes? Um, with all due respect to the governor, when he said what's happening with NIL is awful for our athletes, like that's why everybody hates NCA. Sorry. Like, I think mean, that was a terrible statement. I don't agree with that. Are there problems? Absolutely. Are there things we have to fix in NIL? A hundred percent. But on the day-to-day -day basis, and I would also, we've got uh, several other collectives who are, you know, partners with us in this whole space would probably say the same thing. We do much more good than harm. And uh, like, listen to Maya and listen to her experience, listen to Desiree, like, the difference that this money helps to create socioeconomic issues, other things, and also enhance the journey of that student athlete, I think uh, far outweighs the bad. Are there things that need to be addressed? 100%. Uh, nothing is ever perfect. And we have a lot of really smart people in this room and around this that can help us fix those things. I think as a collective, you know, we're in the interesting situation where we're kind of at the intersection of all this. We deal with the universities. Uh, the university framework, we deal with the student athletes, we deal with our donors, we deal with the open market and the brands, we deal with whatever legislative body, whether it's our state statutes, the NCAA, federal legislation. So we have to kind of uh, toggle back and forth between all these varying interests. And I think if anything today, my goal and our goals of the other collectives in the room is to provide really actual factual information so the really smart people in the room can make the best decisions and to solve some of these problems. And I think far be it for me to say, oh, they should be employees or we should have this rev share and all that. That's not why I got into it. And that's not, if, if y'all relying on us to fix that, yeah, we probably got a problem. Our, our goal and our job as a collective is to take all this experience that we have being on the front lines with the student athletes daily. You know, our collective, like many others, uh, are run by very smart people, that care about their universities, that care about their student athletes. You know, this idea that collectives are some shadow, dark money organization, I think is really uh, unfounded. And so I'm thrilled to death that we finally have a voice in this conversation because, again, we can provide the real information of what's happening at the ground level, in the trenches with our athletes and supporting all our athletes. We have almost 500 student athletes at Ole Miss, and we support all of them. We have for opportunities for all of them, men and women, revenue, non-revenue, and that was a kind of a non-negotiable when they asked me to take over the collective. I'm like, well, it's going to be a collective for every student athlete, not just our football players, not just our starting point guard. It's going to be for all of them in whatever varying form that looks like. So, uh, again, just, uh, you know, a lot of really smart people in the room. And I think we can provide a perspective of uh, what is really reality and what's actual and not what is anecdotal information 
that everything is bad with NIL. I just do not believe that. Everybody here has mentioned by Tyler and I are inequity with men and women when it comes to NIL. How much do collect, you mentioned it there about, you know, offering it to everybody. How much do collectives think about Title IX, which I guess in a way, right, schools think about that probably more, but do co are collectives thinking about that? How much, you know, are they concerned about that being an issue? I try not to look at just like Title IX, like, oh, I hope we check the box with Title IX, because I try to look at it as what's best for the athletes and what's best for these brands and the money. Really, to be honest, our best influencers and marketers are female student athletes. Like trying to get a football player to do something is ridiculous. Like they're like, I don't want, I don't want to mess that. I go to one of our women's basketball players or one of our softball players. They're like, I would love to represent that brand, and I would love to. And so, when it comes to like true NIL for marketplace value, our female athletes are our best endorsers, and they're our best marketers by far. Um, so, but we think about it all the time because, again. I think what you have to realize is the majority of the money coming into collectives is donor funded. Okay. True NIL marketplace value is a very small number of athletes. And there's a very small number of dollars for true marketplace value. I was at Under Armour for 14 years in sports marketing, you know, did deals with Cam Newton, Tom Brady, Steph Curry, Jordan Spieth, all those guys. So I've seen what those market, what those endorsers can do. And it, that's not really, the reality of the majority of the money coming in, the majority of the money coming in is donor funded talent, reten talent retention and talent acquisition. Walker, is that 90%, 95%? Where I mean, would you it's, put it's definitely in the nineties for sure. And it's talent acquisition, talent retention, you know, the majority of the money. Um, so again, selfishly to raise that money, we need to tell great stories and we need to tell, give opportunities for our student athletes, our female student athletes, our non-revenue student athletes, because those are the stories like, listen to my, like, those are the stories that matter. Those are the stories our fans love to hear. Yes, they want to win. Yes, they want to compete, especially in the SEC. It's an arms race. We get it. But those are the things that we think about. Number one, protecting, preserving, and enhancing our student athletes. But number two, the reality of fundraising. And that's the cold, hard facts is the majority of the money is our fans and our donors providing that, not just brands in the marketplace. Uh, I would stay on the, the Desiree, this, this Title IX issue. you got a couple of schools in your league that, that um, are basically an entity of their fundraising arm. Their foundation is handling NIL or, or closely connected to it, and there's some concerns that this could be a, some kind of Title IX violation or maybe even viewed as employment. As an administrator, where do your concerns lie about this issue, which seems to be the next evolution of, of NIL? I, I see it as an opportunity. Um, Title IX, when I look around this room and when I think about just the experiences we've all had, uh, I think we all, A, it's, it's the given in the equation. Right. You got to comply with Title IX. It's a federal statute. You don't have a choice. It's not a, hey, should we or should we not? It, it is what it is. But also we all we all are either products of the student athlete experience. We have daughters. We have sisters. We know how important and how impactful that student athlete experience was um, to the fabric and the ethos of who we are um, in intercollegiate athletics. So we can't diminish that. So let's just figure out ways that we can provide opportunities in an equitable way, in a fair way. And you know what? Sometimes the starting point guard on the on the basketball team, if she has a better market um, brand value, you know what? She may be making more than her counterpart on the men's team. Um, so, but we have, as institutions, what we have to do is we have to provide equal. We have to pro provide equal opportunity equal education. And the education piece, sometimes we're missing that part of the equation. We forget that we have to provide branding seminars. We have to teach our student athletes how to tell the story. We have to help them with their communication and with their branding and really go out there and then actively pursue those opportunities so that our student athletes, we can help them be, be great spokesmen, spokesmen or spokeswomen for those respective brands. But it's, it's really an opportunity and it's one that we're continuing to evolve. We don't have all the answers yet, um, but we're all kind of working at it. And it's almost like we're flying a plane, um, but we're learning how to drive it at the same time. So we know we're going to land the plane and we're going to safely get to our destination. But along the way, we're going to have a little bit of nerves and we're going to make some mistakes. But let's all figure it out together. Andy, to stay on this topic, the relationship between 
um, at NIL in a school in the collective is, is getting closer and closer. We see it. You mentioned it off the top where some would say we're already to the point of employment. Uh, should, why don't we just get this whole thing over with, right? And the schools just start paying athletes. Why, why, why isn't this happening? Okay. Well, so I don't know anything about employment law. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I can, to an economist, it doesn't matter. Like you can call it NIL, you can call it salary. I know that there are different legal implications of those words. You could call it Scooby snacks and it wouldn't matter. Um, what is happening in the marketplace is as, as Walker said, there is a market developing to make sure that an athlete brings his or her face to everything that university is doing in an athletics, whether it's on the court or off the court and in, in doing endorsements. And since you can't give your face to one school for athletics and another for NIL, the NIL price ends up ultimately reflecting the total value. If you let it, if you let it, and I think we should, because I think college athletes are human beings who deserve to earn what they're worth and not have it sort of artificially restricted to, well, um, this is what someone's willing to pay to have you be in a commercial. And this is everything else above that is unfair on market value. And they're clearly paying for talent acquisition. Like that's an artificial economic distinction. And I don't know why we need it. We don't need it for coaches. I saw John Calipari's contract and he makes $450,000 to coach and $8 million for his NIL. And I'm pretty sure he's not worth $8 million for his NIL. That's just a way for the University of Kentucky to pay him in a way that complies with various laws about public employee salaries and things like that. And no one seems to think that's a problem that needs to be federally regulated. It's just, he's really being paid $8.45 million and who cares what you call it? Um, okay, but so um, uh, a thing you talked about is employee status. And I think one of the concerns that a lot of the schools have about employee status is not, oh, are we gonna have to pay minimum wage or things like that, but it's they'll unionize. And, and this is something I am not, I'm an antitrust economist. And if you look at the pro sports every time in the last couple of decades that unions have tried to decertify themselves so they could take advantage of the antitrust laws, the leagues have gone to court and said, please do not let our union decertify because we like having a union because it gives us a framework for uniformity. It gives us, and it basically it gives every single thing that Charlie Baker says he wants. They regulate agents. They have a transparency. All the, uh, Amy mentioned that there's a portal where you can go and look. Well, that's because there's a union and a collective bargaining. And so I think, even though I don't think this would necessarily be the best thing for athletes, if people here are looking for a solution that doesn't require Congress to step in and make special rules, is just take advantage of what is out there. There's a really good employment law that's pro-management and, uh, and can work in your favor. But I think everyone here has been inculcated with this idea, and this is why I don't use the term student athlete, that these are not employees, they're students. But there are lots of employee, uh, students that are employees all over the place. And, and you don't, don't if, if you got over that and you said, well, mate, maybe there's a way that we can rein things in and, and create an orderly system, which again, I, I think we shouldn't. I think, I think the market chaos is what makes America great. I think everybody here who's got a salary in a, in a, in a market where they're not colluding with their, with their fellow employers benefits from that chaos. Um, but to the extent to which the, everyone decides this is the best thing and athletes get a fair representation, you could, you could, you know, the yeah. laws exist. Right. It, well, you mentioned that it might not be the, the best thing for, for athlete, for the athlete to be an employee. And we got one right here. I know it's just one opinion, but mind you, what is your thoughts on athlete and athlete being an employee of a school? Um, I don't know if I'm really big on the being paid to play because I think that takes away the whole essence of college athletics. It's the idea that you want to compete and you want to win games because you're a competitor, not because you're getting paid to do it. I think that is the next level is professional sports, and that's why you want to get to that level. So I don't know. It kind of feels counterintuitive almost to me. And I would say, like, I because I'm a huge competitor, I don't think I would want to be awarded a participation award like of a certain amount of money when I'm sitting on the bench, you know, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem fair just to be paid because I'm on the team. I think if I'm producing a lot, I'm playing really well, my team's winning and all my players on my team, all my teammates are making a lot of money because we're all like 
building the game and our, our viewership is up a lot, like LSU women's basketball, then I think it's fair for them to be getting a lot of NIL deals. Like they had a huge season. All their players are all over social media, earning a lot of views, earning a lot of deals. I think that's fair. But just to be paid because I'm on Arizona women's basketball does not seem fair to me. Desiree, where, where do you, as an administrator, where do you stand on, on this em, em, employment issue? Because there probably are some cases, and, and Walker might speak to this, where, look, you know, football players and maybe some basketball players are going to a school to get paid, right? I mean, that, that is happening. I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, but where do you stand on the, the employment and what that would mean? Well, listening to Maya, and I think that would be consistent with my student athletes as well. They, um, they appreciate the experience of being a student athlete at the University of Missouri, at the University of Arizona. And I don't know if the, I, I know the risks do not outweigh the reward. What does that mean if a student, do you fire a student athlete? What, what would that mean if, um, say you want to change, if you mentioned unionization, say you wanted to change a practice time, is that a term and condition of employment? And, I, and I'm not like a, a real lawyer anymore. I'm just, um, I'm a recovering one to coach, to quote Coach Sly, or Commissioner Sly. Um, but would that be a, a term and condition of employment? And therefore you'd have to go negotiate with the union. And then if say, um, does your coach sometimes text you on practice time changes? Yes. Yeah. So, well, then if we did that, would that be an unfair labor practice? And then we'd have to go in front. I don't know those questions, um, but I think we're taking the extreme on that. And, and we're forgetting about what makes college athletics so great. And these are our student athletes and their stories and their experiences. Um, so, no, I'm not, I don't believe that my student athletes would want that. Um, and hearing the points just articulated by Maya, no, I'm not in favor. Andy, you need. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, if those things were unfair labor practice employments, the reason that people don't want to have employees said is so they can commit those unfair labor employment pro problems in a, in a context free or a consequence free way. I'm with you again. I want to be clear that I don't think I think the European soccer model where you have essentially five power conferences and 34 total conferences is a really great an analogy for the world y'all inhabit. And um, uh, there, the only regulation they have is that teams are not supposed to spend 100 percent of their revenue on players. Um, they still do a little bit, but are they, if they, they can be fined. And if you think about that, a world in which the only cap is don't spend all of your money on the talent, um, uh, whereas, for example, in a union situation, the major American unions have aver averaged around 50% of the revenue. That's the difference between a union bargained outcome, which those, is their right to do, and, and I'm glad they've availed themselves of it, and the competitive market in sports where talent is rare compared, like there's, there are fewer athletes that are good at what you want, then there are spots those athletes want to be employed. So the price is going to go up high. People have said that the NIL market is crazy. The NIL market is undervaluing athletes right now in terms of where we're going to end up because of all the things that Walker talked about. So um, I, I get why people in charge now are afraid of like, well, this has negative consequences. You'd have to figure it out, right? Maybe, maybe there would be an employment things, but once you, once you know the rules, it might be preferable to the, the, you know, the hurly burly of American business, which is much less structured. And like we have right of publicity laws now that no one said, oh my gosh, we need a national right of publicity law. It's state by state. And every other sport manages just fine. And they, they reach a natural national equilibrium for what a, uh, an endorser in California gets paid versus an endorser in Massachusetts or, or Georgia. Some are, uh, uh, but so, so we can get there without it. I'm just saying this is one option if people really feel the need to impose structure. You can impose structure and then expect to get everything you want without bargaining with the other side. Walker, do you, do you feel like an employer of, of athletes? <laughs> not really. And, and I, I would agree with Desiree. Like I have not had one of the, you know, 200 athletes we're working with come and go, boy, I wish I was an employee. Like, I just don't think they think like that. They're, you know, they're grateful of the money that we're 
uh, compensating them. They're enjoying being a student athlete. They're enjoying the experience of being that. Has it changed the dynamic in the locker room and the communication with student athletes? Absolutely. It's a factor that nobody else had to deal with. I didn't have it when I was a student athlete. So it's another factor they have to weigh in where they're going to go to school, uh, how they want to market themselves. Uh, but And then something else Desiree said I think is really neat, too, is you have this pool of budding entrepreneurs. And my whole hokey thought process when I was, when they were, you know, I was thinking about getting involved in this was it's got to be more than just paying the player. Like it's got to be, if we can, yes, compensate them, but if we can put tools around them, resources around them that help them, whether they play in the NFL, NBA, MLB, WNBA, whatever, they're a better contributor to society because of their interaction with our collective, my other counterparts collectives, not just because they got paid money, but they learn how financial literacy, they learn how to budget, they learn how to, what being be a tax paying citizen is. Uh, they learn how to run a podcast, how to run a smart social media campaign, how to start a charity. Like, and again, that's where I go back to like, yes, are there things that I wake up every day and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm having, but there's so much more good in the sense of sitting down the student athlete who comes from a challenged social economic background and saying, and then saying, how do I manage this money? How do, to explain to me how I pay my taxes. Hey, I want to set up an LLC. I want to set up a SEP RA. I want, my mother is a breast cancer survivor. I want to set up a, a foundation for, you know, cancer research. And those things are happening. Like they really are. Um, so I think they're just like in the, in the trenches with the student athletes, they're not sitting there thinking like we are like, should we be an employee, you know, uh, billions of dollars of rev share and all that kind of stuff. They're just not, you know, their, their focus is I'm here to get an education and compete. And our job is the collective and my, our staff is, yes, we're going to compensate you, but we're going to also educate you with some tools to leave better. And I think that's, and again, I don't want to speak on behalf of all the collectives, but the collectives that we all talk about, that's kind of that shared vision of, you know, we're that we're in a cool situation where we can help provide that frame you know flowing off that walker um and i know you're going to advocate that we should no, anyway, no, a little different I, but no i'm just kidding um but you know flowing off that it, two things teaching an opportunity um i remember coach summit tell i asked her once i said you know if i'm going to ever be an athletic director what should i look for when i'm hiring a head coach and coach summit said teaching the best coaches are the best teachers and we can't lose sight on that because that relationship Hearing you talk about your head coach and hearing you talk, um, that relationship with our head coaches and our student athletes is so incredibly special. And we discount that sometimes. Um, the second piece is opportunity. So I have an eight or a 19 year old son and my son is a walk on basketball player at the university. Um, he chose Mizzou first. I followed. Yes, I redefined helicopter parenting. And so Jackson and I, we were at um, we were at. Bud's barbecue and I'm a vegetarian, but anyway, he loves it. So we went to Bud's barbecue and Jackson went and he hit up and he looks like, I love this place. I'm going to tell everybody I know about Bud's barbecue. And so he went out and he asked to speak with the, with the owner of Bud's barbecue. And he said, Hey, um, I'm a student athlete on the men's basketball team. I'm a walk on. I'm, I'm like the 16th on the bench, but I got a lot of energy and I can sell anything. He's like, how about I do an NIL deal with you? You give me a discount and then I'll, I'll tweet about Bud's barbecue. And like my son about two years ago was like a shy young man. And now all of a sudden he's thinking of himself as an entrepreneur. So my kid traded um, NIL opportunity. He gets paid in pork. Um, <laughs> literally. Don't uh, say that around DC. Yeah, DC. Um, but we're, we're missing so many unintended consequences by just focusing on all of, and I appreciate the economic perspective. I really, really do. But that teacher model is critically important. Well, if I can say, want to say something about both of these, and I'll be quick. Um, I didn't get introduced this way, but I am the economist that gave Nancy Skinner the idea doing the first NIL bill in California. Darn, and, I should have, been, should have started with that, shouldn't I have? And, and the reason that I did was for just these things, which is that um, I think that one of the reasons why a lot of professional athletes go broke is because they got told until they became professional athletes that touching money was bad. 
and that they would lose their eligibility. And so if something is forbidden fruit, and then you suddenly have access to a lot of it, and you aren't allowed to get educated about it and things like that. So I think this is one of the intended consequences of our NIL bill was to give people on-the-job training with five-figure or maybe six-figure things. Some of, that's, some of those athletes, most of those athletes, that's the most they're ever going to get. But for the ones that are going to get seven and maybe even eight figures these days, um, to have made a mistake, to have not to have learned how to file taxes, things like that, recognizing that the sort of people who tend to have the most value in a sports context aren't the same as the sort of people who make that kind of money in a suit. Um, and maybe their parents haven't had the same sort of financial literacy that my parents as, you know, my dad went to Harvard for an MBA. Um, uh, that, that I, have, I, I was more prepared than a typical college athlete. And so I think this, we, should, we should recognize, again, that this need for education that has been opened, teaching is really important for, for a lot of things, um, is a benefit of the NIL process and not a thing. And the last thing I want to say is there were people in this room, I don't know if they're still in this room, who said, oh my God, if we let athletes get NIL, they'll have to pay taxes, as if that was a bad thing. And, um, and that was a talking point against our bill because I guess it would be better to earn zero and pay zero taxes than to earn 100 and pay 25 in taxes or to earn 100 million and pay 45 million in taxes. Like I would much rather pay taxes than not because of the, because what that implies. And Andy, when was the last time you paid taxes? <laughs> well, a, no, 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 no um, don't answer it. Don't answer it. As we open it up. Pay estimated taxes every quarter. As we open it up to questions, and I know Chancellor Gerard is one. Uh, two quick questions, if I could, to, to open this up. Walker, you would talk a little bit about transparency and openness and stuff. Does the Grove Collective release all the details of all the deals that you guys do? And if not, why not? This goes back to a question from the earlier panel. The second is, I think collectives get a bad name because people assume they are built up to induce athletes to come to a school to stay at the school for very little work, right? Show up at a children's hospital for a day, we're going to give you $450,000 this year if you do that. So part of it, my question is to Walker is the transparency part. Does the Grove do that and should they? Two, for all of you, where's the future of this headed? Regardless of federal legislation, in Desiree's state of Missouri, Desiree's department, if the governor signs the bill, will basically be able to take NIL in-house in many ways and run it. So do collectives at Missouri go away? If in a year and a half, Ole Miss and Keith Carter decide that we're going to run NIL ourselves, what do you all think that happens from an economic level or legal level or, or my even student athlete level? if that aspect goes away? Yeah, so we do not publicize our deals. A uh, couple reasons, obviously, confidentiality with the athlete. A lot of student athletes don't want that out there. Number two, it'd be a competitive disadvantage. Uh, you know, I've got Georgia and Tennessee in the room, my buddies in the SEC, but we're all trying to kill each other at the same time. Uh, but, you know, we don't, we don't publicize that, you know, for those reasons. Um, and I'm not against some sort of registry where maybe there's um, uh, information about, you know, it's a starter on the women's basketball team that's a sophomore that was a portal transfer made this. Um, and I think that could help. Um, again, so I think you get into the just the confidentiality on that. Um, and I think the other problem is, yeah, look, I mean, you're you're paying again. Uh, I think this is, again, part of the, the challenge that like agents are going to have. So what we pay a young man or woman to compete at Ole Miss, um, and then they go pro, and then Under Armour or Nike comes along and does a deal with them, it's probably much lower than what they were making in, high, in college. And so uh, I think there's, there's some uh, inequities in that piece of it. Um, and again, I, and, I, and as uh, our general counsel, William Liston, said earlier, we're not against uniformity. We're not against uh, sharing information. Um, and it's really hard because uh, you're trying to uh, fulfill obligation for the money you're giving. And in most cases, the money you're given does not equate to what they're doing. So no doubt. Got it. So for the, re for the rest of you, 
if the future is athletic departments taking in collectives or taking more control. And Andy, I don't know if that's even a good economic thing. You're way smarter than me because your dad went to Harvard. So um, what, what um, my dad only went to UVA, so it wasn't very good. Um, Desiree, my, what, what is the future of this look like in the next year? Do athletic departments want to be controlling this themselves? Um, well, first, our our law has not um, been signed, as you correctly noted, um, by our governor. So it's still um, it's still working its way through the process. And technically, we can't bring that collective in house under our current law. We could hire a third party agency, though, and we could pay them a fee to be able to um, to uh, execute branding deals. So it's not completely in-house yet. So there is one extra layer. There are some states and, and within our SEC footprint that have that ability, but it's not um, at Mizzou. Uh, so what does it look like? Well, I think it's an evolution and I it almost is changing hour by hour. I remember right before uh, Commissioner Sankey went um, to last week in Destin just to go speak with, with reporters, we got word that, Cal that the California bill had passed the assembly. So it's literally changing hour by hour. And so we're all trying to see and forecast around the corner. And we all don't necessarily have the answers. Um, we're identifying some of the problems, but I know that whenever we're tackling anything like large scale like this, we got to listen to people. And then we're assessing and constantly redesigning our plans as we go. Um, but I know that we want to be mindful of our Title IX responsibilities. We want to be mindful of the fundamental concept of fairness. Um, and the reality is that we're all competitors. So as we're designing those programs, we're keeping all of those fundamental elements in mind. I have a simple rubric, which is obviously college athletes have uh, an academic requirement that they have to fulfill. But if you grant that, other than that, there's no reason to treat a coach differently than an athlete in terms of what you contract with them the way that you um, give them buyouts to solve the problem of an unenforceable contract, um, the way that you induce them to come to your school. So this idea that NIL may exceed the endorsement value of an athlete, it doesn't exceed their total value. If it is, then somebody's making a very dumb decision because by paying more for something than they're worth, not a good way to run a business. Um, and I imagine that your donors are quite good. Some of them are quite good at, their, at what they do in, in their day jobs. So um, what would the future look like? I personally, I, I am very pro Title IX. Title IX has Can some- Can I ask you one quick question on that? Um, and you were talking yeah, about yeah. value. And so you said something about that your, people are going to pay what they're worth. Mm -hmm. But the problem, I think that what I was hearing from Walker earlier, and sometimes you don't know what everybody else is paying. So people are going to pay what they're going to pay. And then that's really what the worth is. Sure. But right? like nobody knows what I'm getting paid, but my, my whole profession succeeds in offering people jobs because that's how sort of the labor markets work. So do you, are you for that transparency system? I think that, the, okay, this, I, I really don't want to hop the panel. It's, it's, um, it's, a, about a, different it's a long, mind. it's a long answer. Um, because I'm an antitrust economist, I tend to see, I only get called in when there has been an antitrust problem. Those sort of price exchanges are very easy to become ways of price fixing. So in the chicken industry in Georgia, everyone had to report the price that they charge for chicken and eggs. And then they all said, okay, why are, we, why are we paying so much for eggs? Let's push the price down. The egg farmers didn't appreciate the fact that the transparency was turning into a device to depress what they earned. And that was big business, essentially. Chicken farmers are, are not wealthy people as a whole. They, that tends to still be a market where you have the, the um, you know, the, the ma and pa farm. And, and it was used by big, big agribusiness to push prices down. But if done carefully and not one, one, not just the chicken industry, but some sort of coalition so that it's, it's, that there are safeguards, I think the transparency can be good. Uh, I think that there's a, would be a, a concern. I, I think you said it, and I apologize if I'm putting words in your mouth, um, that doing that might make the price go up. Because I think right now, the, the asymmetry of information is helping the collectives and the schools, not the athletes, because they're, hey, $500 seems great. I didn't get anything last year, especially if you, if you come from limited means, $500 seems like a lot of money. Oh, well, you would have gotten $25,000 if, if you had known that this guy over here was going to. So, so I think that, you know, I think it's good. I think we have to be careful. I'm sorry for such a long answer. 
Yeah, no, that was great. And, and my, uh, and we'll go to President Gerard here next, but I wanted really quickly you comment on on this. Would would you want people to know? Hey, this is what I make from NIL. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I don't know if I would be bothered by it or not. I'm not. It's a little bit above my pay grade. I just think that we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. And I think NIL is a great blessing. It's an opportunity, but it's only the icing on the cake. And it's not the reason why I play basketball. The reason I play basketball in college is because I've worked my whole life too. It's been a dream of mine since I was a kid and I love the sport and I love to compete. I love the camaraderie and the people I meet and the places it will take me, but I don't play because I want to get paid. That's not why. That's why I want to be a pro is to be able to profit even more so, but we play college basketball to represent our universities, to compete, to meet new people, to travel and, and to really like just grow as people because we go into college as kids and we come out as adults. So I think that's the main thing we have to do. Whatever rules or regulations need to go in place, that's above my pay grade, but that's all I have to say. All right, we're gonna start with questions. President Gerard. Very, yeah, there we go. Very well said, Maya. Um, Great panel, a great conversation. We've heard a lot about the good that this has brought. Uh, what we heard a little bit in the last panel is some of the challenge that it's brought as well, right? And what we heard also was uh, there was probably an opportunity a few years ago to set this up, maybe a little bit better and a little more structured. The one restriction that was put out there was not to be used for recruitment. So I'd like the panel to talk about that a little bit and then talk about what got layered on top of that, which I don't think anybody anticipated was the transfer portal and how that now has come into play. And then you layer on multiple years of COVID eligibility and the impact that that's had. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you all see that. Uh, Walker. NIL, recruiting, collectives. We, you, you talked earlier about the ground floor. You're on the ground level. You've seen this stuff. And not only that, but you've seen it in the SEC. Tell us about, yeah. We're trying to come up with a chicken farmer in Georgia <laughs> analogy from the California economist. Uh, I didn't think I'd get that today. But uh, uh, no, I think, uh, again, uh, it's, Doc, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, we certainly see the transfer portal providing a level of free agency. Uh, and look, the transfer portal was created basically because coaches could leave and go and move and the players couldn't leave and go when they had certain events happen in their lives. Um, the transfer portal has taken on a whole new meaning. And NIL has, because of the, uh, the, uh, the um, you know, uh, evolution of NIL. And it is a challenge. And it is one of the things that I don't love. Uh, I don't love how it's changed coaching. I think coaching has gotten way too dependent on NIL. Coaches don't evaluate near as much as they used to. They don't build the relationships as much as, used, as they used to, and they use NIL as a crutch to get themselves out of a bad situation. Uh, oh, well, if I misevaluate that kid, he'll just leave, and I'll go find somebody else to take their spot. And so I think it's actually probably hurt coaching a little bit in the sense that it's provided that crutch, and I don't want to say lazy, but I think coaches like, oh, we'll just, you know, the portal will fix it, uh, and NIL will fix it. And so – and that wasn't why the portal was created. So um, I'm all for um, the transfer portal. I think it's necessary in some cases, but I would like to see some limitations on it because of what it's created from a free agent standpoint. A coach voluntary and voluntary leaves. You fire your coach or he goes to another place. Uh, you've been at a school for more than two years. Um, you have a life event, death in the family, medical problem, you know, those types of things. So um, I think those were the reasons why the portal came about. And then when NIL came in, it just it evolved the portal into a form of free agency. I think there, we were looking at it yesterday. There's 25,000 student athletes in Division One in the portal right now. Walker, do you have any sense of how many of those went in or how many of them got pushed in? No, I think, look, and I, I think when an athlete goes somewhere and he goes, you know what, this isn't what I thought it was going to be, or I'm homesick, or I want to try a new major, or I want to go someplace where I can play because I can't play here. And they want to leave. I think that happens a lot. I think the problem is a lot of people are taking it. And William talked about this. When you sign your contract with the collective, you're not bound and you can go, well, you know what, I got my bird in the hand. So I'm going to go see what I'm worth in the marketplace and put my name in the portal 
and use that as a bargaining tool. And I kind of like it here, but I'm going to go use this to go make some more money. And I think that's where it's evolved to, which I don't think anybody loves that. Um, so, uh, but again, if there's, if there's, you know, life events or those other things that I talked about that are justifiable, then we should give the athletes the ability to go put themselves in a better situation. Um, so, uh, I think that is one of the problems that I think needs to be addressed, whether that's the NCAA or whether that's a federal, um, uh, statute or federal law that puts some protect. The other thing too, is the portals open all the time. So, you know, we are re-recruiting these kids or, you know, keeping them to stay here or go somewhere else the whole year. And it's exhausting. Um, so uh, I think there could be some tweaks to the system that get it back to the true essence of why it was created. Does that make sense? Um, and that's just the reality. Again, I don't think anybody loves it, uh, but it's the reality on the ground, Ross. I'd like to touch on that. I would also add that I think, I've heard, I think, especially with this day and age of social media, I don't know if publicizing amounts of deals and the amount of money players are making would be helpful because I know players that went to the portal because they think they can make money somewhere else. They're like, I see she's getting this. I want to make money like that too. I think I can do that. Oh, my coach said this. My high school coach said that. My parents' friend said that. This person said that. Like everyone's in our ear telling us, you should go here. Look at what she's getting. Look at the amount of money she's making. Even if you were already happy with the school, if you were happy with your teammates, if you were happy with your coach, it just takes away from the essence of college basketball or college athletics in general. And I, I don't think the grass is always greener on the other side. I think it's greener where you water it. So you, you're playing, you're producing, your NIL will grow organically. You know, I don't think it's safe to advertise it and create this illusion that you can just go chase the money. You have to put in the work and make the smart business choices and the investments and it will grow organically. Water your grass. Very good. Uh, we have a question off to the left, I think. Yeah, this is Jeff Cravens with on three. I think my question is um, long-term funding of when you talk about name image and likeness, shouldn't it be tied to some of the media rights money that we see is really driving the growth in the marketplace because it's really about using the athlete's name, image, and likeness within those within that media entity. Great question. And Walker, I think me and you were, were talking about this uh, last night. Is is the uh, the donate do, donor money right? How tired maybe that some of the donors are getting by continuously having to to donate to this pool. So Walker, speak to speak to that, and then Desiree maybe take that too. Yeah, I mean, donor fatigue is real because capital is Desiree being an athletic director. You still got to build facilities, still got to hire coaches. You have all those other capital campaigns. Those things don't go away. So donor fatigue, donor fatigue is definitely something that is real, um, and we see it. Um, we were talking about Matt Hibbs with the the Georgia Collective uh, brought up an interesting concept that we were talking about where uh, maybe the conferences uh, take a percentage of their TV money and those types of things. And they all allocate it to their member schools as a percentage of revenue for NIL specific purposes. Um, and doing that, they basically tell the schools, you have to, your state law has to be here and you have to abide by the enforcement of the NCA. Uh, and now you give the NCA some teeth, you get the patchwork of different varying state laws, more yeah. symmetric. Uh, and you're funding to Jeff, your question, you're funding NIL through true name, image, and likeness. Uh, again, I don't know. Conference commissioners probably would have scoffed at that six months ago. Now they're probably like, I don't know. Maybe we should think about that. And again, there's a lot more. It doesn't say it's not that simple, but, uh, I think NIL in the present state cannot sustain itself. At the end of the day, what's happening with collectives and power five schools. And again, that's, that's the world we're in. That's all I can really speak to. I can't speak to everybody else, but in the present state of NIL, it is not sustainable for 90% of the schools out there. because of donor fatigue, because right. of donor fatigue, rising cost, the uh, patchwork of state statutes. I mean, I think the state statutes are a race to the bottom. Oh, we'll up yours and we'll go do something even more. Um, and so uh, I think that's going to create really some serious inequities. So 
Uh, again, my job is not to say that we should do this or shouldn't do this. My job is to say, here's what's happening on the ground. And if it doesn't change, it is not sustainable. And so we have to make some tweaks to the marketplace, which will then preserve the sustainability of NIL for our student athletes. Um, and so some sort of rev share with conferences uh, or something else, I think all that stuff should be on the table. Yeah, Desiree, if you want to add to that, but also uh, how do you balance this? Because you're trying to raise money for your school. You use donations for to pay for some, for I think Olympic sports scholarships, of facilities, coaching salaries, and then you have this NIL thing over here. Only 15 minutes left? Goodness gracious. It feels like we've been up here forever. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you all would probably feel the same way. Uh, to your original question, um, nothing's off the table. I think once we kind of come up with those parameters and we continue to figure out what the optimal program is, then this is important. We'll find a way to fund it. Fred Chapman, my NIL pay. I like to talk a lot. Sorry. Uh, Two, two comments and then a question uh, about Title IX. First, uh, I don't know much about cloning, but you guys, Walker and the guys in this room, if you could clone them and have them be running the collectives across the country, we'd be better, better off. They're really good and they really care about the student athletes. So I think that's important. So good job, you. guys. A little bit about how it kind of works so that people understand and you can you can correct me too, Walker, but when the collective brings in money, they're trying to do one of two things for student athletes, right? They're trying to find sponsorship deals like an Under Armour deal or whatever, right? And the second thing is then they get money from donors. And to get that money to the student athletes, they have to create activation events. So it's, it's, it's a little more complicated. Now, if you're a big guy, like we're talking about, there's 69 Power 5 schools out of 1,080 NCAA member schools. And maybe half of those have or as sophisticated as these guys. And he just said he does about 30% of his student athletes, 200 out of about 600, right? So they're really struggling. And these are the best guys. So that's why I want to talk about Title IX. And Andy, my, my question is ultimately for you, right? So I talked to a bunch of these smaller collective guys, and they don't have the resources to help all the student athletes. They don't have the resources that Ole Miss have. They have a men's basketball program or a men's football program, and they get money for that. It's not that they don't want to help female athletes. It's that they don't have the resources to do it. They only have enough. They can sell some bobbleheads. They can sell some subscriptions, but they don't have the resources to create all these events to give money to these kids. So, Andy, my that's why Title IX is a major issue, because they focus on the main revenue sport of their school. So. How do you, without, without just saying we're going to split this money in half 50-50, how do you enable that? How do you help these women athletes in, in, in the Title IX space get more access to that money with, within the confines of the system as it is today? Well, you, you took away my answer with the without part because <laughs> Title IX is law, as Desiree said, and so like I, the analogy I give is there, if you have an employee, you have to pay payroll taxes, right? You have to contribute to FICA, all those things. If you were to say, well, we don't have enough money to pay them their salary and their FICA, so we're just going to skip the FICA, that wouldn't be legal. Instead, salaries adjust. You recognize if you pay a dollar, you're really paying a dollar thirty. If I only have a dollar, then I better not pay them the full dollar. I might better only pay them 80 cents so that the FICA gets to a dollar. And so if a collective, I'm not saying that they are, but if a collective were determined that they had to follow Title IX and your big donor says, I only want to give to football, you say, well, you can give a million dollars, but we have to, by law, dedicate half of that. And it's not exactly half, but we can all just say half for now to women's funds. So essentially, you're giving me a million so I can give half a million to football. And I've got to give a half a million to the in aggregate to women's act, women's opportunities. That isn't the case now. So the, total, the, the collectives don't do that. It might be the case if the, if the money was run through the schools. I don't even know that because Title IX only applies for financial assistance and is that's why, coach, that's why Nick Saban makes more than all the women coaches at Alabama combined, because they don't have to match salaries there. But to the extent to which NIL payments are considered financial assistance, then that's how it would work, is you recognize you have an obligation and you, you build it into your willingness to pay for the services you're acquiring. Any more questions? Over here in the left. Thanks, hello everyone. Um, 
I thought it was interesting. Multiple people on the panel, including the student athlete, all echoed the sentiments of not being overly thrilled about an employment model of what, and what that could mean for the student athlete. So my question here is, why do we think the employment model system has gotten so much traction to be a part of the conversation? And part two to that is, how do we better create a system to amplify the voices and tell the story of a system that the student athletes want to participate in? Anybody want to? Well, I mean, I listen to students more, like, like create a system that a lot of the people are here today. I know that they are also like, there are SEC people lobbying in Congress. The athletes don't really have that. I know there are a few people trying to form some sort of players or organizations, but, but, um, like, and so this is weird. It's like, I think that if we gave athletes employment status for the purpose of forming a nor Pennington protected lobbying group, and then they went and they met somewhere and they talked about it, we could find out more what they want. And if the answer is that Maya is representative, then that's not, that's what they're going to bargain for. And it's not going to really, you know, like the threat. Oh my God. Um, the issue is that if you create a situation where the athletes really can't congregate, you will get people, even if they're great people, you get someone who becomes Gene Upshaw eventually. And the, the NFLPA, they were very unhappy with Gene at the end of his tenure because they felt he was in the, in the market for Gene and not for them. And so that, that's an issue. But like, you know, um, Maya, I'm glad, so glad you're on the panel, but that's pretty rare to, 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 give, to give the athletes a chance to do it, to talk for themselves. And, and, and the SAC, for example, which is the NCAA's thing, like those things tend to be dominated by people who have more time. So it's somebody, on the women's golf team. I actually disagree respectfully. Sure. Um, to say that we don't listen to our student athletes is, I see several- You may, but Congress isn't. But our student, but we are listening, not only just to the SAC, you seem to be minimizing the SAC and the SAC is very important on our respective campuses. We meet with them every month. We meet with groups of student athletes all, daily. So no, I, I don't think we should say that the role or the voice of the student athlete is something we're not paying attention to because that's not been my experience. I'm looking at my colleague from yeah. Clemson, my colleague from it's, Illinois, and I bet they would also echo that. The distinction I would make is listening to versus heeding um, and, and treating them as, as equal partners. I don't, I don't think even the best school considers their athletes to be equal decision makers in the process of the decisions. They're, they're much more solicited for ideas than they used to be, um, but it's, it's like the FARs. The FARs have a voice too, but the FARs don't make decisions. But I don't, I don't, but I don't think, to Desiree's point, like, I don't think the athletes are screaming for that. I think they trust their athletic directors. They trust their, co their coaches uh, that we talked about earlier. And again, I think that this is new, like the role of the athlete, and we have athletic directors in the room, the role of the athletic directors has dramatically changed. And, you know, athletic directors now are considering a lot more stuff that they used to not have to factor into. So it's an education, not only for the student athlete, but for our administrators, our leaders, our school presidents, uh, our coaches, et cetera. So um, I, I just would, yes, I, I kind of, I agree with Desiree in the sense that the athletes, for the most part, feel like, you know what, this is way more good than bad. The marketplace is something that has evolved and has given us opportunities. Are there things that need to be fixed? Absolutely. If we're trying to give athletes a voice to Congress, I'm not, I think that is like futile in my, in my opinion. Now, can Congress help us? Probably at some level, but really it's going to be you, you, Graham, other ADs, Jed, my coaches, that's really where I think this needs. Did I miss somebody? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I go around and point everybody. But that's really where I think the movement needs to come from. Yes, can Congress help us to some degree? But we have a lot of really, really smart people, especially in this room, that care about these student athletes and they're in it every day with us in the trenches. Um, and so I think um, just staying focused on that, I think we'll do ourselves good. But let's hear the voice of the student athlete, yes. right? Maya, you, you on SAC. Yes, on I SAC, am on right? SAC. Yes. Yeah, tell us about what your opinion is of this conversation of, of, of athlete's voice. I completely agree. I don't think I want to have a opinion and 
voice my opinion to Congress. I think SAC is a great opportunity for me to speak on behalf of my team and to meet with other student athletes. I don't think there's any serious pressing issues where I feel like I would need to go to Congress and tell them how I feel. At the end of the day, I'm here to play basketball and to get an education. And that's what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to expand myself too far. Otherwise, I can't focus on what I came here to do, which is to help my school win and to get my degree. So you think team maybe feel similar or absolutely my teammates would say I just want to hoop that's what they're saying <laughs> I just want to hoop <laughs> good over to the left here uh, hi uh, Scott Sodeth Washington Navigators represents several universities here in Washington in this space um, speaking of Congress a couple of the draft bills under consideration would uh, prevent you Mr. Collective from engaging with the student athlete until after they've been enrolled at uh, said university for a specified period of time, whether it's a semester or 90 days or unclear. Would that help address some of the transfer uh, portal pressures? And, and also from the athletic director, do you think this would work? And would it help the pay to play inducement? Yeah, I think it can. I mean, I pay, I Played football at Ole Miss for now Senator Tommy Tuberville, which as a side note, just emphasize the point, you can be anything you want to be in life. Um, <laughs> I love you, Coach, but I never thought you'd be a senator. Uh, but, uh, but in talking to my former coach, who's now a senator, um, and I think, you know, some of the things that he did propose in his are actionable and I think would help. I think you know, as he said, we're going to stay really, we're not going to get too granular. We're going to try to stay above the fray. We're going to try to get some basic uniformity and some basic directional things. So um, the portal was one thing his bill uh, went after a little bit of as far as trying to tighten up the portal a little bit to uh, doctor's uh, question earlier. So, um, so again, yes, I think Congress can help in some ways. If we're putting all this on Congress to fix everything, I think it's futile, but some of those things, uh, I know that the uh, congressman from Florida has a pretty narrow bill that has some good things in it, too. So if we can try to cobble that together, yes, I think it can help us, Ray. Agreed. Uh, I think we're, we're about wrapping it up, huh? I do have well, one question, just on the student-athlete's perspective. I will say, though, we haven't talked about the, the College Athletes Players Association and the voice there because they have had a voice at the table in Congress and several members of Congress are, um, you know, talking directly with them. So I would just say that there, there is a perspective on that avenue. And so having this other avenue, I think would only benefit um, the dialogue there. Yeah, it's like the latest Congress, Jason Stahl is the College Football Players Association uh, executive director was there and was a witness, you know, at the, at the hearing. Um, and in very recently, they've made some some uh, uh, encouragement to athletes to actually not participate in the EA Sports college football video game because of the price. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of this, <laughs> but which is, yeah, it's a, but it's a good point. I, I don't know if anybody has say any more about that. At the hearing, I think they also had a Florida State softball player that yep. participated. Yeah, several. Yeah, at least at least a couple of student athletes have have appeared at hearings, but. Andy, do you want to finish us off with anything? Um, well, I, I do think that um, if you look at where the bills are coming from, the Democratic bills are listening to athletes. I don't think that the, is it Bill Arrakis? I'm sorry if I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I, I would love to know whether he took a meeting with Jason Stahl or Ramogi Huma or not. I, I'm guessing not. That isn't the only way you can access ath athlete voices, but those are spokespeople for a constituency within the within the ath college athlete community, um, and you know, I think ultimately, I, I'm with you. I don't think that it's. I think it is futile to think that um, Congress is going to fix things. But if that's Plan A and Plan B and Plan C, which I've heard from some people at the NCAA, um, you you need to not just have a wish list, but also have an have the ability to negotiate. I I want to just. Before we before I swing it over here, uh, thanks, Bobby, for putting this together and inviting all of us. It's been great, and it's been a great conversation. Thank you very much. And we're only halfway through.